Hi dear students, welcome back to the online classes prepared and presented by Mr. Abdul Manaf, Assistant Professor, English Department. This class is meant for MA English Literature students under Calicut University. Let's discuss Juno and the Peacock today. This play is contributed to literature by an Irish dramatist and memoirist, Shannel Cahasi. Juno and the Peacock was first staged in 1924. It was first staged at the Abbey Theatre in Dublin. It is set in the working class tenements of Dublin in the early 1920s during the Irish Civil War period. Let's understand the play act-wise. When we come to the first act, the scene opens on a two-room apartment in a tenement house in Dublin. There is a picture of the Virgin Mary below which hangs a bowl containing a floating votive candle, furnishing and other belongings are sparse, consisting of a dresser, a small bed, a fireplace, uh, a box of coal, an alarm clock, a bath, a table and chairs, a teapot, a frying pan, a few books, and a long handled shovel. The act opens with Juno Bailey and her daughter Mary discussing the murder of their neighbor Mrs. Tancred's son, written up in the all early morning newspaper. Mary's brother Johnny, thin, pale, and fearful, irritably tells them to stop reading and leaves the room. Juno asks if her husband, Captain Jack Boyle, has come in yet. She tells Mary he will have to go without breakfast if he doesn't come in soon, for she is afraid he will invite his friend Jock Sojali in to share his tea if she leaves. She complains that he has already worn out his health insurance and will soon be out of unemployment, yet he is always singing. Mary seems unperturbed, tying a ribbon around her head and musing about which color to wear. Her mother complains about her being on strike and thus not contributing to the household. But Mary insists that a principle is a principle. Johnny reenters. He walks with a limp. Having been shot in the hip during the Easter week rebellion, and he has also lost an alarm. He is upset that Mary is leaving the house, since he doesn't want to stay home by himself. Juno reminds him that his father will be home soon, but Johnny counters that his father hates to be asked to do anything. He asks if the candle in front of the picture of the Virgin Mary is still lit, and Juno reassures him that it is. Jerry Devon, a young man, enters and Mary hurries out. He reports that Father Farrell uh, has offered Barley a job. But Barley is still out drinking with his friend Joxer. He has a habit of drinking. Who is a friend of Joxer? Befriends him for drinking. Jerry rushes out to find him and Juno complains that her husband will deliberately miss the job. Boyle and Joxa can be heard coming up the stairs with Boyle singing. Juno sits on the bed with a draperies hiding her from the view of the newcomers. Boyle invites Joxa inside, reassuring him that Juno has left. He grumbles that Juno is always complaining, and Joxo agrees that this is a hard thing to put up with. There are more complaints with many other characters here in this drama. So, uh, students, 
please understand which are the complaints on uh, on whom complaints in home boyle uh, offers jocks a cup of tea at this point juno makes her presents none she sarcastically offers jocks an egg as well flustered he says he is in a hurry Boyle and Joxer begin uh, talking of visiting the foreman of a job to start working. Juno expresses her disgust for the uh, charade and uh, chastises her husband for his laziness. She complains that everyone calls him Captain, Captain. When he only once went out on the water, Juno asked Boyle if he saw Jerry. She complains that he was in a pub. Why did he go there? Boyle swears he was not. When she urges him to eat breakfast, Boyle proudly counters, I will have no breakfast. Uh, you can keep your breakfast. I have little spirit left in me still. This is the quotation. Jerry re-enders and confirms that Boyle was lying since the foreman in Folly's pub told him Boyle had left just ten minutes earlier. Rather than confess or apologize, Boyle complains about being watched all the time. Jerry delivers news that he can have a job if he goes to Rath Mines, and Boyle complains of sudden pain in his legs that would make it hard for him to walk. Boyle goes into the bedroom to change into his work pants, and Gino leaves for work. Jerry speaks with Mary, telling uh, her that he will likely uh, be elected secretary of his union and explaining how well he could support her. Mary has no interest and asks him to let her go, shouting when he refuses. Boyle reappears and asks what all the hillabello is about. Or the sounds or uh, uproaring uh, voice Mary and Jerry exit, and Boyle complains about children not caring about their parents anymore. Despite his bold words, Boyle puts the breakfast sausage on the pan to cook and starts to sing. Steps are heard on the stairs, and he hides the pan under the bed. Where does he hide the pan? Under under the bed. But it is only a man asking if he wants a seeing machine. Boyle continues to cook his breakfast and sing, but is interrupted again by thundering knocking at the street level door. Johnny fearfully asks who it is. Joxer is afraid to look, but Boyle says it is a man with a trench coat who is going away. Boyle invites Joxer to stay for tea. Joxer is afraid that Juno might return, but Boyle convinces him that if she did, he could climb out the window and hide on the roof. Joxer agrees to stay and the two speak briefly of books inspired by one of Mary's on the table. Boyle uh, tells Joxer of the job uh, he is going to. Joxer says it is good news, but Boyle reminds him of the pains in his legs. The two complain about Jerry Devine, Father Farrell, and the clergy, with Boyle arguing that it is no way to reward Johnny for his service to his country by making his father work. A call vendor's voice can be heard selling call blocks 
uh, as Boyle and uh, Joxer reminisce about um, Boyle's um, fictitious days on a ship. The two hear footsteps near the door. Boyle frantically tries to hide everything and Joxa rushes to escape out the window, but it is only the call winner asking if they want any call. Boyle asserts that he has had enough of flying Genozodas. Today, Joxa, there is going to be issue, issued um, a proclamation to, uh, pro proclamation be me um, establishing an uh, independent republic um, general have to take an oath of uh, allegiance Juno's voice can be heard outside and Joxa throws himself out the window when Juno enters Boyle denies her assertions that he and Joxa had been together. She tells him to smarten himself up as a visitor is coming. Boyle assumes the visit has to do with another job. Juno refuses uh, to tidy the room and uh, Marion does with uh, Charlie Bentham a tall, good-looking young man. Boyle and Johnny can be heard arguing humorously as uh, Boyle changes out of his uh, work pants. Uh, Gino introduces Johnny to Bentham, bossing of her son's service to Ireland, and then introduces her husband. Bentham explains that Boyle's cousin Mr. Ellison has died, and that he wished to leave his property only to his second cousin, Michael Fenigan of Santry, and to Boyle, his first cousin. He explains that half of the property would be worth between uh, 1,500 and 2,000 pounds. The entire family is Ecstatic, Boyle claims that he is finished consulting with Jackson, who angrily uh, climbs in through the window. The two argue humorously. Jackson exits, and Boyle claims he is a new man, singing emotionally to his wife about how dear she is to him. This is what is the first act. When we take Act 2, it takes place two days after the first. The setting is the same tenement apartment, but it is now full of gaudy furniture, pictures, huge vases with artificial flowers and paper chains stretching across the ceiling. Barley lies sprawled along the sofa smoking a pipe until he hears Jaxer, at which point he jumps up and busies himself with paper. Jaxer enters and delivers money from Mrs. Madigan, which she raised by selling some blankets and a table. They talk about Father Farrell, the priest who had arranged a job for Barley in Act 1 and prompted uh, Barley to complain about the clergy. Barley now defends him and, uh, contrary to what he had said before, asserts that the priest were always on the side of Ireland's people. The two complain about Bendham who's giving up his job as a teacher to become a lawyer, and Jerry marries two students and Joxer leaves. Johnny enters from the bedroom and Gino and Mary arrive with a grand phone. Gino is concerned about how much debt they are acquiring. She asks Johnny if he has looked at the grand phone, but he responds irritably that he cannot think of uh, such things. 
He has been sleeping at different houses each night and is unable to get any rest. Bendham arrives and Juno makes him comfortable. He is now engaged to marry. Barley notes that Kenzal's type of uh, government security uh, are down by a half a percent, showing what a state of chaos uh, the country is in. When, especially when Juno asks for an explanation, Barley responds that it's no use explaining such a thing to women. Mary comes in the room, Bendham gives her a com uh, compliment, and the conversation shifts uh, to religion. Juno complains that the world is no better with religion since people do not follow them well enough. Bendham explains his own belief system. Theosophism, based on the Eastern Vedas. Bailey chime, chimes and throw out with wildly sounding commands, even though it is clear he doesn't know anything about what Bentham is talking about. The topic of ghosts arises, and Bentham proposes a scientific explanation for their existence. Johnny gets upset and uh, rushes into the room uh, on the left. A moment later, a scream is heard. Johnny comes back, trembling. He has seen the ghost of Ruby Tancred, the young man who had been shot kneeling in front of the statue. Juno converts him and Johnny asks her to check if the light is still illuminated in front of the statue, Juno Barley and Mary are the hesitant uh, to go to the room, but Bentham goes in and assures him that it is still burning. There is a knock at the door and jocks her and the neighbor, uh, Mrs. Madigan enter. Introductions ensue. Mrs. Madigan drinks some whiskey and Barley calls for singing. Mary and Juno comply, followed by Mrs. Madigan. And Joxer, who keeps forgetting the words. In response, Johnny and Barley ask for the gramophone instead. Just then, Mrs. Tancred walks by, accompanied by several neighbors. They mourn the passing of her son, a die hard. Juno explains the story to Bentham, uh, not nothing that he and Johnny used to be inseparable. Johnny, though emphatically, denies being his friend. Juno regrets disturbing the funeral processions with some. Boyle argues that it is the government's business, not theirs. But Juno enumerates all those who, in the tenement, uh, who have lost a, a relative. However, she uh, accuses that perhaps Mrs. Tancred uh, dissolved her fate for the allying the day hearts into the tenement. Johnny relatively asked them to stop uh, talking of such things and marry and bend them go out for a walk. Upon urging, Barley resigns a humorous poem he wrote then puts on the gramophone. As it plays, the door opens and Needle Nijand, a uh, Tyler, walks in. He chastises the family for blasting music as the funeral processions of uh, Mrs. Tancredson passes the house. Mrs. Madigan carries that he doesn't look uh, particularly grief-stricken himself and accuses him of supporting both the uh, Republicans and the free states. There is noise outside the street and everyone but Johnny looks out. Part of the crowd's singing and observes comment on the funeral processions. Everyone but Johnny goes downward for the better look during the procession. When Johnny is alone, the mobilizer of 
an officer. Mobilizer, an officer charged with calling soldiers to action. Anders and tells Johnny he must attend a battalion staff meeting in two nights. The staff thinks he may know something about how Ruby Tancred was found. Johnny denies knowing anything about the matter and says he refuses to go. These are the main incidents in second act. When we go through act third, it takes place in November, two months after the end of act second. The votive light under the Virgin gleams even more brightly, Juno and Mary discuss. What do they discuss? They discuss about Bentham, who has uh, disappeared to England without leaving Mary his address. Mary was madly in love with her fiancé. Even though he admits Jerry may have been the better man, and uh, what else if he left because the family was not good uh, enough for him? Juno supposes it was a bad idea to introduce him to Joxer and Mrs. Madigan and uh, laments that Mary uh, waits or Mary waited so long to share the news with her mother. Juno speaks with Barley, who complains of parents in his legs. Um, the two argue over the fact uh, that they still have not received any money, although they are deep in debt. Barley asks for some stout. Um, stout, it's a type of beer. Beer liniment and a newspaper and Juno places a second bottle of stout uh, on the table. Juno and Mary leave, heading for the doctor as Mary is not feeling well. Joxer and uh, Nugent enter the room while Barley is in the bedroom. Nugent tells Joxer how he went to uh, the lawyer's office and found out that Barley will be getting no money due to the way the will was written. The lawyer has told the same thing to Barley, who has visited repeatedly. Najin complains that Barley never paid for his suit, and Joxer says he is glad he had nothing to loan him. Nothing to loan him. The two hear Barley coughing and realize he is in bed. He is in the bedroom. Najin opens the door and asks to be paid. Rather than acquire or accusing, uh, Barley asks for a heavy top coat as well. Angrily, Najin rushes into the room and takes the suit. Much to Barley's dismay. At the same time, Joxer slips uh, the bottle of stout from the table and pours it in his pocket. Barley complains about Nugent to Joxer, who expresses his outrage of, um, of fame's ignorance of the event. Joxer wonders aloud if perhaps Nugent had heard something about Barley's getting the money. Uh, Barley realizes a second bottle of Star is gone from the table and blames that on Nugent as well. Mrs. Madigan enters and asks for the three pounds back that she had raised by uh, selling blankets and furniture. Barley says that uh, it's not possible, is it possible? Is it possible? And that she will have to wait, intent uh, upon getting her money back. Mrs. Madigan uh, takes the gramophone ready to bring it to the pawn shop. Though complains that is has not even been paid for yet. After she leaves, Joxer expresses his outrage again, yet again wonders aloud if uh, perhaps she has heard something about Barley not getting the money. The two argue and Joxer leaves. 
Johnny and Juno enter. Juno is visibly upset. She sits the family down and explains that Mary is pregnant. Barley threatens to go to England to find Bentham and bring him back to marry uh, her. Then complains about that Mary's plight will go to him and his reputation. So better uh, Bentham uh, has to marry, uh, marry her. Juno points out that Mary will have far more to deal with. Barley wants to uh, tell his daughter off, but Juno says that if he does, she and Mary will both leave. Johnny has a little sympathy either and wants, uh, wants for what? Once again, wonders. So, um, Johnny, Johnny has a little sympathy either and wants to drive his sister out of the house. Juno says they need only move somewhere where uh, they are not now using the money they'll be getting from the uh, legacy or legacy. At this point, uh, Boyley admits that they will not be getting any money. Since Bentham wrote the will correctly, instead of naming Barley and the other beneficiary, he simply wrote first cousin and second cousin. What an idea it is. So uh, now all cousins can claim a portion of the money and the legacy has become worthless. Johnny is outraged at his father. Infuriated that he uh, ran the family into debt so he could drink every day. Juno tries to placate him, but he blames her too for not checking up on Barley and looking after the money. There is a knock at the door and two furniture men enter to take back the family's furniture. Juno leaves to find Barley, Mary returns, and Johnny chastises her. Jerry enters, uh, looking hopeful. He um, tells her mother, uh, mother has told him everything and that he loves her more than ever, even though she had left him for uh, another man. When he learns that she is pregnant, however, he expresses his pity and leaves. As he goes, Mary recites for him some verses from his lecture on humanity's strife with nature, whose message is that the world is both a beautiful and a horrific place. The furniture men return, saying they can't wait for Barley any longer and start carrying some things out. Johnny chastises Mary again for uh, telling of the shame uh, she has bought upon the family and she rushes out. The votive light flickers for a moment and then goes out. Johnny cries in fear to the disgust of the furniture man. He says he feels a pain in his breast. And if he were uh, getting hit by a bullet. At that moment, it was at that moment two irregulars entered the room. One orders the furniture man to face the wall, while the other tells Johnny to come with him. We learn from their conversation that Johnny had given away. What Johnny had given away, um, Robbie Trancred's hiding place to the gang who kill him. The irregulars drag Johnny away. 
and the curtain falls. When the curtain rises again, most of the furniture is gone. Juno and Mary sit by the fire, waiting for Johnny. Mrs. Uh, Madigan comes in and um, tells Juno that two policemen want to speak with her. Uh, they have found a man they think is Johnny. Uh, Mary laments that there must not be a god or um, he would not let such things happen. But Juno responds, Ah, what can God do against the stupidity of men? That is a quotation. Juno decides that she and Mary won't return to the tenement. They will live with Juno's sister until Mary has her baby, then walk together to raise him her, uh, or her. She urges Mary to come see Johnny's body, then changes her mind, chastising uh, herself for her selfishness. She repeats, Mrs. Tancred's swords from when uh, she lost her son, praying for humanity to lose its hatred and receive eternal love. They all exit the stage slowly. In the last scene, Barley and Jocks are both very drunk, return to the apartment. Barley wonders aloud what the policemen were doing with Gino and Mary. He has just one coin left and uh, drunkenly wonders where the chairs have gone. He supposes he can join the IRA if need be. The play ends with uh, Boyle's uh, characteristic saying. The saying is famous and it is very important. Uh, I am uh, telling you, Jaxar, the whole world is in a terrible, terrible state of uh, chases. These are the words by Barley. Barley's characteristic saying, once again, I am uh, telling you, Jaxar, the whole world is in a terrible state of uh, chases. This is what it means. Okay, uh, thank you for watching this video and learn something more about Juno and the Peacock in uh, coming videos. Thank you.